I'm Helmut Butzküffen. I'm a, a section leader of the MS Research Group, which spans across the, the Melbourne, um, a Melbourne set of institutes. I particularly work at the University of Melbourne Department of Medicine and the Howard Florey Institute. The biggest focus of my research group for a long time has been the neurobiology of, of MS. That is to understand how the brain actually responds to the inflammation that is uh, present in MS, good or bad. Uh, because we do know that people with MS have widely different outcomes from very mild to very severe and we believe that somehow the responses of the brain to the inflammation are important in determining those outcomes, like who does very well and who does very badly. The second and increasing interest of my research is genetics, human genetics, and there are significant advances in human genetics, particularly in the last five years, but like all answers, they just lead to more questions. So in large-scale collaborative work, really across Victoria, across Australia, we're trying to address some of those questions as to how does MS develop in humans. And the third interest is really translational, more translational. One of the um, new initiatives in Melbourne is that uh, we are currently building uh, something called the Melbourne Brain Centre. The Melbourne Brain Centre will house basic scientists but also translational researchers. So it's a bench to bedside model. Some of that institute will be physically actually placed inside the hospital. As I'm also a neurologist looking after a lot of people with MS, this allows us to actually hopefully translate from bench here to bedside in the hospital by physically actually being in both spaces. So we're very excited about that model. And one of the flagship projects is a project which MSRA is uh, very strongly supporting and trying to raise money for and support administratively, and that is the vitamin D in MS project. Uh, vitamin D is taken by lots of people with MS on the basis of a lot of advice uh, globally to try and reduce inflammation, try and reduce relapses and then perhaps even reduce the risk of developing an M MS in, in children of people with MS. But at present time, there's actually no real evidence that taking vitamin D works. And MSRA in conjunction with a lot of researchers around Australia, including myself, is very interested in putting some evidence in place, speak a clinical trial to actually work out whether taking vitamin D reduces MS inflammation. Our projects in neurobiology over the past five years have actually been quite varied and there are lots of biological processes in the brain that you could look at. Uh, most people understand that there's inflammation and this inflammation produces damage to myelin, the, the covering of the nerves. So we see a loss of myelin in patches, the so-called MS lesions. Another kind of damage which occurs and which is actually quite vicious is cable cutting. So cables or axons in the brain transmit all the information. And it seems that perhaps as a bystander effect or as an innocent bystander, some of these cables are cut or destroyed. And the cell type that seems to be responsible for that in the brain is called the macrophage. So macrophages are essentially eating cells and their general purpose is to mop up damage. So when this damage to myelin occurs, these cells move in and they try and eat in a clear way as much of the debris, as much of the damaged tissue as possible. But in that process, they kill axons, cables. The problem is that once you've killed an axon, once you've killed a cable, it doesn't regenerate. So the myelin, to some extent, actually regrows, as um, many people know, this process called remyelination. But an axon in the brain or spinal cord that's cut is cut forever. And it seems increasingly likely that actually this sort of axon damage gradually 
slowly wearing away at the um, capacity of the brain to compensate, it actually produces most of the disability in MS. So we've crystallized, or I've crystallized, the particular research that I'm interested in, in understanding how macrophages kill axons. Because you could think that if you understood that process <coughs> and you understood exactly how that happened, you might be able to inhibit it or reduce it. So that rather than perhaps reducing MS itself or curing MS itself, you could simply reduce some of the damage which occurs inside the lesions if you had the right drugs to do that. At the moment, we understand that one of the substances involved in, in macrophages being overactive and killing, uh, killing axons might be a molecule called DAB2. Now, the DAB2 project is trying to understand that in detail and also trying to understand if we can dampen this damage by reducing the amount of DAB2. And this is a project funded by Multiple Sclerosis Research Australia over two years. It's preclinical, which means that working in cells and animals to understand this as proof of principle. How long does it take for a discovery project to get to clinical trials? If you have a good target, so if we identified an actual substance which definitely changed the activation of the macrophages, changed their ability to kill and destroy axons, it would depend entirely on the substance. The substance could be something that, we, that is already known. For example, vitamin A. In that case, clinical trials can proceed rapidly, of course, because a lot about the safety of that drug in humans is, is already known. And vitamin D is a good example of this. Like We don't know whether it's going to work uh, in MS. It works in animal models of MS. And really, the only thing we need to conduct a trial is money. In other circumstances, where the drug might be expensive, difficult to make, you need to fundamentally convince pharmaceutical companies to partner you in these projects. So my work in genetics is really as part of a very large group. In Victoria, what we are particularly trying to do is to understand how so-called MS risk genes work. So MS risk genes are genes, genetic variation, that you know underpin human difference, I mean, that's why we all look different, that are somehow very weakly associated with getting MS. So we, we know some, some of these kind of genetic factors, broadly speaking, are being female, because women get much more MS than men, being Anglo-Saxon, rather than, say, Chinese, because that means the risk is about 30-fold greater. But modern MS genetic or general genetic techniques have actually allowed a much more detailed map. That map is about to be published later this year, we think, and might contain as many as 100 individual variations that are all very weakly associated with MS. It's actually important for people to understand that these are not what we call mutations. Okay, these are not things that really go rapidly and badly wrong. Um, people might be aware of diseases like cystic fibrosis or hemophilia, where there's something really wrong with one of the proteins of the body. They don't work and the lungs clog up or you know, a major disease happens. What we're talking about here is actually perfectly normal human variation. So sometimes half of the human population might have the risk gene. It's just that when we look at a thousand people with MS, in fact, 10,000 people with MS, and 10,000 people who don't have MS, slightly more of them, if you like, have blue eyes. You know, slightly more of them have these very common risk genes. So now that we know 100 of them, we're trying to understand how they work. Unfortunately, it's not easy to understand how they work. They, they are in the genetic code. 
But um, one of the questions is, do they influence um, what we call the expression of the gene? So the gene is a code which is translated. There's 30,000 genes. And any given part of the body you know, will express some of them. So is it that you have a code that encodes a risk for MS? Does it drive a higher or lower expression of the, of the relevant gene? And that's what we're trying to understand. So this, this kind of research takes people with MS and people who don't have MS, it um, takes their blood and measures the risk genes and also measures how much of them, how, how well or how strongly or weakly they are translated in all the different immune cells. Um, so this is painstaking work, actually directly involves collaboration between five different institutes and it's a slow accumulation project to ultimately understand you know, how this information, this map of MS actually works. It's getting one layer, uh, one layer of an onion peeled back, seeing the next 20 layers underneath. So ultimately, perhaps, this, this map will actually explain a lot of why MS happens. It might allow us to interfere at the earliest stages and, and reverse some of these MS processes. That's, of, of course, the hope.